Nen? Okay. Can someone unmute and tell me if they see the screen, if they can see the presentation? Yes, we can. Okay. Thank you, Shauna. Okay. Uh -huh. All right. So, like um, we talked about, we're talking about decluttering your life today. Um, this is a vital aging presentation. I do a lot of presentations in senior centers in person. So, if you guys attend any senior centers, Check out when I am there and come to the classes. They're a lot of fun. We have a lot of participants that come and it's a good way to make friends, engage and learn about ways to live healthier and healthier lives. So I just wanted to touch on our Pearls program. This is a new program that we've rolled out this year for seniors in the community. Um, if you do attend a senior center, this could be for you. Anyone that has depression or struggles with depression, you don't have to be clinically diagnosed, but if you have some form of depression, we offer eight free sessions of therapy for you. And this is Pearl's program is a structured evidence-based program that we do with you. And it's a behavioral action plan. So we set goals, accomplish goals, and tackle the symptoms of depression together. And we have been doing it. We rolled out this program and we've had a few people try it out with us. And so far it's been going really well. So if you'd like to give it a shot, or if you know someone that might wanna try this out, this email right here, pearlsofvalleycares.com, um, is the way to contact us. Or you can call Valley, and I'm sure they would direct you to the right place. Or you can reach out to me personally. Um, it's a great program to take advantage of, and it's free. Why not? <laughs> All right. So, first, I like to start with an open um, introductory question just to get everyone talking. I'd love to hear people um, tell me something that you treasure, a valuable item that you own. Thing that means a lot to you. Hopefully, I don't see cell phone on this, <laughs> even though it is valuable. I want something really sentimental that means a lot to you guys. You can put it in the chat box or unmute and just speak. No need to raise hands. Family pictures and history. Great. My grandmother's quilt. Oh, that's awesome. That's a good one. Um, An antique bookcase that my husband restored. Oh, that's cool. Got a handy husband. <laughs> Sweet. Okay. Got some good ones there. Uh, now we're going to talk about the difference between collectibles. Oh, I see my great ring, family pictures. A lot of these with a lot of sentimental value. That's really good. Awesome. Okay. So we're going to talk about the difference between clutter, collectibles, and hoarding. Clutter is a mess or disorganization. Um, and the lack of time or desire to sort through things. So don't look at my bedroom right now. That's where you will find an example of clutter. Um, if you notice that you're really busy or you have a lot going on, typically you have a little more clutter and that's okay, but it does affect our mental health a little bit. And we'll talk about why in a minute. Collectibles are storing prized items and showing them off without intervening one's living space. So a lot of those answers to that opening question are sentimental or collectible items. And these are great. These are stored prized items that mean a lot to you. And maybe they're on display for people to see. Maybe they're in a special place that you know it's safe and taken care of. That's awesome. Collecting is great. Hoarding, however, is when one's items take over the home and may create safety concerns. So this could be clutter times 10 or collectibles times 10. Anything that causes a safety problem I will show you a picture right here. This is hoarding to the right. Any time that there's space for rodents or pests to be living with you, or if there's a tripping hazard, there's stuff on the floor that you maybe in the middle of the night you can't see very well and you can trip and get hurt, or if there's mold or any room for anything that would cause harm to your safety present is hoarding. This would give me nightmares too, Pamela. <laughs> Thank you for that comment. So that is hoarding for you. Why do people hoard? So obviously we don't wake up one day and say, okay, I'm gonna just hoard all my trash today and I'm gonna make my house a mess, right? That's not something that just happens overnight. Usually it's because of something that's going on underneath in their soul or in their mind. So some things that cause this are altered brain connections. So some people have abnormal brain development and it could be from birth 
or it could begin after brain damage due to surgery, a stroke, infection, or even an accident that you got head injury that can cause altered brain connections. You can also see hoarding in some people on the autistic spectrum or that have ADHD. And this next one I thought was super interesting, serotonin and OCD. So obsessive compulsive disorder, usually when people have OCD, you see ultra organized, everything's in, uh, in place, everything's organized, um, all the pencils are lined up perfectly. I think there was a show called Psych. Oh, can you guys not hear me? I just got a notification that my sound might be off. I can hear I, I sure can you. hear you. Okay, maybe it's your sound. I would try and play around with that a little bit. Um, okay, so with OCD, it can also affect you on the opposite side, where maybe you hoard too much and you don't want to throw away anything. Thought that was kind of interesting. And last but not least, the most common with seniors, especially for hoarding, it can be because of stressful life events, such as grieving, grieving the loss of a loved one or a loss of independence or because of a change in your life or lack of control that you might have. People typically tend to hold on to their things as a way of holding on to the past. So those are some things that can contribute to hoarding. Let's talk about clutter in the brain. I have this cute little picture here on the right that is a kind of a good thought provoking question. It says, if the organized state of your living space is a reflection of the state of your mind, what does your room say about you? And that's why I say, don't look at my room right now because it's pretty cluttered. <laughs> I've got a lot going on. So think about that a little bit. What does your kitchen or your car or your room look like? Is that a reflection of how maybe your life is going? If you're at a peaceful Zen, if everything's going smoothly and your house is clean, maybe that's why. Maybe you're a stress cleaner and your house is extra clean because you're going through a lot. I don't know. It just kind of shows a little bit about your personality there. So this is kind of interesting. Let's talk about how it affects our psychological being. Research shows that disorganization and clutter have a cumulative effect on our brains. So our brains like order. They always have. That's why kids get put into school at an early age and following school, it gets them set in that routine for careers, right? They get up, get dressed, go to school, come back, do their homework, eat dinner. They have a routine and that's a good way to grow and thrive because our brains like having that routine. That's why we go to bed when the sun goes down, wake up when the sun comes up. So visual reminders of disorganization drains our cognitive resources and it kind of affects our ability to focus too. And when we can't focus, we can't pay good attention or close attention, which can affect the way our brains store our memories. So this actually can reduce our working memory as well. So think about that when you notice that your brain seems a little foggy, your memory is a little foggy, our focus isn't that great. Maybe take a look at your environment and say, okay, what needs to be sorted out that's on my mind right now? Let's talk about collecting. I found this picture of collections on the right and I thought it was interesting. Someone's collecting rubber duckies. <laughs> Do we have any collections? Any collectors here in the audience? Does anyone collect anything? I'd love to hear. I love hearing what people collect. What's important to people. I collect house plants. I have 16 right now, so I'll start. That's a lot, but I love it. Gives me a sense of purpose to take care of something since I don't have children. What do you guys collect? Memories. Oh, that's great. And that doesn't take up space. So that's great. What else do we have? Antiques. Ooh, that's cool. What was that? Oh, no, I didn't hear that very well. Do you mind repeating that one more time? I'm sorry. Can anyone hear okay? Okay, I saw books and antiques. That's great. Lots of collectors here. So, why do we save things? What makes us collect or hold on to things that we find important to us? There's three different reasons or three different categories for why we save things. The first one is sentiment. Something can be sentimental. It's a part of you. It's attached to a memory or a feeling or a time of your life that you want to hold on to. Maybe it's instrumental. 
which could be useful. You might need this someday. Somebody could use this. This could help me. Or intrinsic, which means the item has value. So maybe it's an antique and you could sell it for a lot of money, or it's a really expensive item that is worth a lot. So those are typically the three things that we tend to hold on to. So let's let's play a little game here. If everyone could unmute for just a minute, this will be so fun. Um, we're going to play a game. I'm going to have some words pop up onto the screen. And if you guys don't mind just shouting out whether it's sentimental, instrumental, or intrinsic, or if you want to be bold and just say trash, that would be fine too. <laughs> Let's see what you guys think. Junk mail. Trash. <laughs> trash. Some people say instrumental because there could be coupons or something, right? Does anyone think junk mail is sentimental? No. No. No way. Just recycle it and move on. There you go. Love that. Old photographs. Sentimental. Perfect. Books? Intrinsic. And sentimental. And instrumental sometimes. I work yes. in the library. Great. Yeah, these could be all three, right? Depending on what the book is. Storage containers. Trash. <laughs> Instrumental. Instrumental. Okay. Canned food from 10 years ago. <laughs> Trash. 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 Sentimental. <laughs> <laughs> if they're bottled. <laughs> yeah, if they're bottled, yeah. Bought trophies. Sentimental. Sentimental. Trash. <laughs> we got some minimalists here. I like that. <laughs> awesome. Close. Sentimental. Instrumental. Intrinsic. Be all three, I think. All right. Thanks for playing that fun little game. I hope that was really exciting for all of you. <laughs> It's kind of fun to see what people think and how they differentiate in opinions on how valuable certain things can be. So when we're deciding, this is kind of a good way when we're going through our house, we can say, okay, is this sentimental? Is this instrumental? Is this intrinsic or trash? Sometimes it's really obvious and we automatically think, oh, that's trash, throw it away. Or this is sentimental, keep it. But what about those things that are kind of on the fence or maybe a gray area that we don't really want to give it away or throw it away, but we also aren't sure if we really want to keep it. It's kind of on the fence. So one example of a way to handle that would be a pros and cons list. I have an example here for Tupperware. So let's say we hold up a piece of Tupperware. We're organizing our kitchen and we say, okay, pros of keeping it. They're useful. You can always need more, right? You're always cooking. You can store food. That's great. But the cons, if I give it away or throw it away, I already have 10, right? So do I need 11? If I got rid of it, will I really miss it? So it kind of puts that into perspective a little bit. Think about what it would be without it. And if you think you could be okay, or it's easy to replace or inexpensive to replace, maybe it's worth getting rid of it and clearing up all that space to clear your mental clutter for the time being, right? Try That's a little experiment you guys can try next time you organize your kitchen or your, your room or your closets. What do you guys do though? What are some ways that you determine when it's time to get rid of something? Do you guys do the pros and cons list method or is there another idea or example of something you've tried that's worked for you? Um, I have locked things up for several months and then just to see if I didn't need it and then okay. give it away. Perfect. That's a good idea. Try experimenting by giving it some time away from you and see if you need it. I just cleaned out my clothes closet. If I hadn't worn it within the year, I finally was able to move it on. Some still had tags on it. So that's my interest. That other word. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. Hopefully I can make some money off of it. <laughs> good for you. But that feels good. That is good. Okay. No more hangers. One article in, one article out. That's so True. smart. 
Yeah, talking about shopping when you decide to go buy something, say, okay, I already have six black cocktail dresses. Do I really need seven? If I do buy the seventh cocktail dress, I'm going to have to throw away three of them or something like that, right? Replace it with something that you might need more instead of collecting more and more. Great. Uh oh, okay. So if it's been used or not used, change of the season, I had a couple people say during the change of the season is when they go through their stuff. I think that's super smart. After summer, if you noticed you didn't wear that summer dress that you've had for a year, you didn't wear it all season, maybe it's time to get rid of it. Or when you pull out your fall sweaters and one's out of style or has a tear in it, maybe it's time to replace it, right? Good ideas. So some cultures value and respect things more than others. How are you guys influenced in your culture with your things? If you look at people in Hollywood versus people in a third world country, Things and items are used very differently and valued very differently. Are any of you guys from Utah or not from Utah, from the States, not from the States, and you feel like you've been shaped by your culture with the way that you view things? No one, huh? All right. Sure. My in-laws lived through the depression and kept several things and reused even if they could afford to buy something new. The value things, uh, the value things and was hard to get rid of, rid of other things, but they didn't hoard. Okay, so they That's had good. a good balance with it. They kept all their things and valued stuff, but they also knew when it was time to throw away stuff too, right? That's great. All right, having troubles separating from items. So when you're learning to identify and challenge your thoughts and beliefs related to acquiring and saving items, it's good to um, ask yourself the questions. You know, why do I hold on to things? What makes this collection important? Is it because of sentiment or fear of change, fear of losing the past, OCD? You know, I had someone in one of my previous classes say that China was a big deal in her family, collecting China. And she has all this China in boxes that's super sentimental and valuable to her. And she had her family kind of there just writing together her will and kind of dividing up who would take what stuff if something were to happen and she were to pass away. And she said, okay, who wants my China? Getting all excited to see them fight over it. And none of, none of her kids wanted it. And China is not so as valued as much as it used to be back in the day, which is sad because they're beautiful and they're worth a lot of money, especially back in the day. But um, it kind of shows you why am I holding on to this sentimental thing if when I pass it down, it won't matter to much as much to my children as it did to me? So maybe those are good questions to ask while you're going through and decluttering your house. Okay, is this sentimental to me? Why? And is it going to be sentimental in the future? And then also think what beliefs are causing me to hang on to these things, right? Because your beliefs, your belief of that we're gonna run out of toilet paper during this COVID pandemic. So stock up while you can, right? That's a belief that some of us had. So we stocked up or maybe the belief that our children will value something more than, than us. That, I mean, those are all beliefs that could or couldn't be true. So challenge that next time you're um, decluttering your home. All right, man, I'm sorry. I'm talking so much today. I hope you guys are having fun. <laughs> all right, set small achievable goals. When it's time to declutter and tackle our kitchen or our shed or garage, basement, whatever we're organizing, don't wake up one Saturday morning and say, okay, I reserve today to clean out my house, right? We can't do that. Some cute um, gentleman in one of my classes said, how does someone eat an elephant? The answer is one bite at a time. You can't eat a whole elephant in one bite. So tackle the elephant with one bite at a time. Start small, one room at a time, one drawer at a time one day at a time. Now, you know your limits. I'm sure our limits change as we age and maybe we can't move as fast as we used to or bend and pick up things as much as we used to. So respect your body's limits and your emotions limits, right? It's a lot of decision-making in that process and take small bites and decide to do little by little. And also when you're going through, think about the last time when you used these things, think about the function it serves, and recognize any emotional attachments to it. Do you guys have anything to add to that? When you're organizing, um, 
one at a time. What are some what are some ways that you guys try and keep it small and simple but productive? How long do you plan on keeping to keeping this stuff? Is it useful? Um, yeah. That's a great point. How long do you plan on holding on to it? Did you have an expiration date for this item? Is it does it serve me any purpose anymore? Right? Great. Okay. I might look at things a little different than other people. If it's if it will make you money, if it's a tool or something, a craft like that, that's well worth it because you could always fall back on that. Uh, canned goods or bottled goods, like the one lady mentioned earlier, that's something you can keep. But after things are outdated, how long do you keep them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are good questions to ask yourselves, huh? Great idea. All right, I'm not closing out quite yet. I just want to show you. I'm going to open up one more thing. Where is it? Okay. I wanted to talk about, oh, wait, no, this is the wrong one. Sorry, guys. Um, what, when we, after we get rid of our stuff, we obviously want to replace or we go shopping and we want to replace our things, but we want to do it in a healthy way um, that allows us to not get back to that square one of having all that clutter. Can we see everything okay here on this new presentation? You just see the participants on the screen. Okay. Oh, that's my bad. Hold on one second. All right, that should do it. Okay. So shopping can be sometimes cheaper than therapy. <laughs> I thought that was a cute little quote I saw. Um, retail therapy is a shopping with the primary purpose of improving the buyer's mood. This is something that a lot of us fall into, maybe too much, or maybe we have a healthy balance of that. When you buy, wait, hold on. Sorry, this is covering this. When you are stressed or overwhelmed, think to yourself, do I shop a lot? Is that when I tend to buy more things? Or is that when I just don't even want to step into a store? I don't even want to think about buying anything right now. Like there's two kind of people they want to shop to release that endorphin, or they just don't even want to think about buying anything or making decisions. Um, some people feel the need to change up their environment or appearance to find relief, meaning they need to buy new things. I remember when I first graduated from grad school, I was about to start my first real career job and I was very excited um, and a little stressed out and a lot of things that were happening were kind of out of my control and I was getting a little nervous. So one day. I said, you know what, I'm going to change my room today. And I went and spent like $400 and bought a new comforter, new pillows, plants, furniture, all new decorations, things like that, and just shook up my whole environment and it made it more of a sanctuary for myself. And it was nice because I needed all that new stuff and it did bring more peace to me. But at the same time, that can be kind of scary if you're spending a lot of money that you didn't have budgeted for a purpose. Um, there was a study, oh, or rearrange your furniture. Thank you, Debbie. Yeah, that's a cost efficient way to change up your environment. Maybe move things around or find new decorations that you have down in storage that could shake up your environment. Um, there was a study done on retail therapy and it showed that buying new things only gives you happiness for about 24 to 48 hours. So keep the tags on it for 24 to 48 hours and if you're not happy with it anymore, return it. Or if you're online shopping, some strategy that you can do is put it in your shopping cart and wait 24 to 48 hours. And if you still want it, then you can buy it. Or if you still need it, you can buy it. So be smart with that. That can be a little tricky. Sometimes you might need that temporary relief, but not if it's, it's not gonna be super long lasting. So recognize that. Shopping gives people a sense of control over their life and their things and can be an effective way to cope for temporary relief. So a healthy way to retail therapy would be to throw out the old things first and then replace them with the new things rather than just accumulate a bunch of stuff. I think we talked a little bit about that 
someone said, I don't want to buy any more hangers. If I buy something new, I got to throw something out. That's a great mentality to have. So I'd love to hear, I'm sure we all have a stress purchase that we've made in the past and maybe it helped and it was a great purchase and you loved it. And maybe it really made your family or your husband or your wife mad because you didn't plan for it. And now you have this expensive thing in your house. Do you have any funny or helpful stress purchase stories? Clothes. Yeah, stress purchases can be clothes. Gives you a little feel good boost and you can feel cuter when you go out. But they didn't fit when I got home. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> well, all these clothes came home and they didn't even fit. That probably didn't help with your stress at the time. <laughs> okay. Shoes and purses one too many times. I feel like a lot of us women struggle with that, huh? We love the shoes, purses, and clothes. All right, so when does retail therapy become a problem? Obviously, it can cause later regret when you spent the money that wasn't meant to be spent, can build up stuff in your house, and you can get stuck in the, or sucked in the keeping up with the Jones mentality, always wanting to buy the next big thing. And that adds, to, this all can add to your stress and make it worse. So coping mechanisms, take this one very lightly and only for a 24 to 48 hour fix, not for a long-term fix. Assuming more doesn't make us happier. It just raises our reference point. One thing about America, one of our struggles in America is that Americans, most Americans are in debt right now because as soon as they get a raise or a promotion and they get more money, they raise their cost of living to match that. They think, oh my goodness, I'm making more money. Now we can move into that big house that we've always wanted. Or we can get that Lamborghini that you've always wanted to drive. Or you just want to raise that reference or you want to raise your... Um, your assets. And Socrates is a really good quote. He says, the key lies not in just seeking less, but enjoying less. So I have a little challenge for you guys that really works with this, that I tried. It's been experimented by me. So obviously it's accurate, right? <laughs> just kidding. So write down a list of 10 things that make you truly happy. And really think about what are the 10 things that make you the most happy in this life? And you'll notice that it's not always, oh, getting a new TV, getting a new watch. I mean, that does make you happy for 24 hours. But the things that really create long-term happiness are things like barbecues with my family or spending Christmas with my sister or going on a walk on the beach in nature. And most of these things don't cost any money. Real happiness doesn't always cost money. So if you notice that, then you'll enjoy living in a more minimalistic environment, not having as much stuff, but filling your time and space with memories and events and people and relationships. And that'll actually make you enjoy living with less, like Socrates would say. As you own fewer things, you realize that you don't really need that much to be happy. You may even sense peace and freedom that comes from owning less and unburdening the desire to own more. So be careful in falling into that trap of wanting to buy more or better or the next best thing. Because in reality, it only makes you happy for 24 to 48 hours and then you're right back to where you started. So try and find ways that really make you happy that don't involve stuff. Moral of that slide right there. So retail, <laughs> this is funny. I saw this online and I <laughs> looked at the um, background on how it was created, but it's kind of cool. It says retail therapy myths. And what I really want you to focus is just that little last last little blue part. It says, while women embrace retail therapy, studies show that elderly men benefit the most from daily shopping. Elderly men who shop daily are 28% less likely to die prematurely. <laughs> they didn't have a super big, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? They didn't have a, a big study on it. Like there wasn't a ton of people that participated in the study to make it super accurate on America but it was enough to put, make this little um, drawing and I thought it was cute. So there you go, men, start doing some retail therapy. <laughs> I'll let my husband and brother-in-law know that. <laughs> really? Okay. Get them start shopping. Yes, that's great. So do we have any stress cleaners here? Are doing on time? Okay, we're good. Any stress cleaners? 
Yeah, okay. Yes. Me, yes, okay, we have some people. I'm one of those people too, so we can relate here. When things feel out of our control, people tend to turn to rituals like cleaning to self-soothe, right? Cleaning provides a sense of control over our environment. And when we're putting all of our energy into our jobs, into relationships, into our community, we don't really know what the outcome is gonna be. We don't know if we're gonna, what we're gonna get reciprocated. But when we clean, we know what's going to happen. It's going to be more fresh. It's going to be less stressful, less cluttered, and we know the outcome. So it helps us to put our effort into some things that we know what the output will be. And it's it's a way to feel accomplished too. So I thought this is kind of cool. Home Depot is my favorite store, and I wanted to talk a little bit about COVID. Obviously, this has been a big life-changing incident the last two years. So I wanted to see how... Um, some stores were affected by the COVID pandemic with people feeling out of control, stressed out, depressed, all these feelings. So in 2019, the sales were at, were at $108 million. Um, that's obviously not thousand, sorry, I need to fix that. <laughs> sales were at about $108 million. In, two, or in 2021, Already, this was done in August is when I created this. So in August, the sales were already at 132 million. So it already surpassed it by $24 million. Home renovations and cleaning were off the charts during COVID. A lot of people were working from home and they started to notice, wow, my baseboards look like trash. I need to fix that. Or, hey, let's build a garden. That'll be fun. And it gives them a sense of control over their environment since everything was out of control during this pandemic. Did anyone do any remodels on their home during COVID? I did a lot. Yeah, Shauna did. Yes, okay. I'm seeing a lot of people say yes here. So that's great. We're contributing to the statistic. Oh, someone said no. Okay, you're one of the few. <laughs> home improvement. So there was a study done on home improvements. 76% of respondents of the survey stated that they made at least one improvement to their home during the COVID pandemic in the US during 2020. 64% renovated their exterior, 58% renovated their interior, 44% introduced new home technology. That's crazy, that's half of the population or half of these respondents, which was a big chunk of people that are doing renovations to their home. They're controlling their environment, they're stress cleaning, or they're coping by improving their home. I thought that was a kind of cool way to, to take care of their problems there. So let's talk about you guys. I want to hear, I'm, I'm, you're probably sick of hearing my voice, just like I am. When are you guys likely to buy more things? Are you, are you more likely to buy things when you're stressed out and you want control? Or do you not like to buy things when you're stressed out? You prefer to buy things when you're at, in a level headspace. A little of both. Sometimes it's really, you know, relieves you and other times it's just for fun. Great. Okay. When are you guys more likely to clean or organize? What emotions, not so much like what days or what seasons, but what emotions motivate you to clean or organize? For me, it's when I'm feeling overwhelmed or stressed is that's the part that I have control is my environment around me. So then I can clean as much as I want and organize as much as I want. And it's almost like instant gratification. Like after you get done cleaning or organizing a space, you look at it and you like automatically feel better. Yeah, so. that's great. I agree. I saw someone say, I clean when I'm mad. Helps relieve anger. Yeah, those are great answers. When have you guys, now let's talk about parting from things. When have you guys successfully parted with your things? What emotions or what headspace are you in when you're able to part with things? When you're grieving, when life is great and you're happy, when you're stressed out, do you just need to get rid of stuff? What emotions drive you to part with things?
when I'm feeling overwhelmed. Oh, overwhelmed. Yeah, I think with stressed out, uh, uh, I'd I look at it as less is more. Yeah, helps declutter. A lot of people are saying when I'm stressed out, I need to get rid of things or when I'm confident in my decision making. That's great. So it's interesting. You see two different sides. When I'm confident, when I'm calm and everything's going great, I feel like I can make those decisions. Or some people say, I'm stressed out, I'm overwhelmed, I need to just get rid of some things to clear my mind. It's interesting to see the emotions that drive those decisions. So it's important to be aware of those patterns during these different times of your life, because it helps you to prepare and make those decisions ahead of time. So when those emotions come up, you know how to handle it. Thanks for your answers, guys. That was really great. All right, let's talk about why we buy. One, recognize why you buy things. Are you out to buy things because you're stressed out, because you're feeling insecure, um, because you just got a big paycheck and you want to keep up with the Jones? Really think about your emotions and the time of in the phase of your life that you're in when you decide to go shopping and buy a lot of stuff. Think about non-materials in your life that bring joy, peace, and satisfaction. So I think that's really important. Say if, if you're looking for that happiness boost. Do we really want to spend our money and buy something that won't last? Or should we call up a friend or go on a walk or do some meditation? Find ways to increase things that bring meaning and purpose to your life by doing that. All right. So I'm going to give you guys a challenge before we go here for next time or just hold each other accountable. Choose four words that you'd like to describe your home and have them all be a sensory thing. So how your house feels, looks, sounds, and smells. Does it, do you want it to feel warm or cool or relaxed? Do you want it to look bright or dim or dark? Do you want it to sound calm and quiet? Or do you like the noise and the busyness? Or do you like the sound of jazz music or echoes? And then what smell? I put cookies, I'm a foodie. Maybe like the smell of lasagna or a fresh candle or lavender. Write those four things down because we want to control our whole environment, not just the clutter, but our whole environment and our mental space too. And take three steps to get your home closer to those words. So it could be rearranging your furniture to feel more open or cleaning out your room and decluttering, um, adding a new candle or maybe a different light fixture that boosts the mood and that'll help your environment and mental space. Um, there's a lot of different ways or pulling out that um, scent spray that we have in our storage that will really come in handy right now. Try and shift your room a little bit or your main living space to fit those words a little more and see how that affects your mental um, your mental well-being for the next time. Does that sound like a challenge we can all do? I'll do it with you guys. We just put up our Halloween decor, as you can see. We put little bats and ghosts and stuff. But I do want to clean out a little more and put a pumpkin candle in here. So that's going to be my goal this week. So hopefully you guys can follow me and do something too. And that's all I have for my presentation. I know it's a little early. It's 2.45, but we can leave this time open for questions, comments, stories, jokes, anything you guys want to add to this presentation. I love feedback and commentary. So I'll leave this open to you guys. Thanks, Kayla. That was beautiful. Very good done. No problem. Thank you. Kayla, do we have any questions for Kayla? Nope, I guess that's it. Well, thanks for coming to our Healthy at Home webinars. And I guess we will see you Thank next you. week. Thank you all. You're great. Bye, Bye. everybody.